Welcome to Afterlives with Kara Cooney, in which we discuss ancient Egyptian history and relevant current events that we think will be of interest to our audience. I am Kara Cooney, and I'm a professor of Egyptology at UCLA. This podcast is separate from my teaching and research roles at UCLA. In recent years, I've become active in communicating with the general public about the history of ancient Egypt through lectures, interviews, social media, books, and guest appearances. This podcast is my opportunity to take the kinds of deep dives into history that are not always possible in academic formats. Welcome to our uh, latest episode of uh, Afterlives with Kara Cooney. I'm Jordan Belzinski. I'm Kara Cooney. Hello. Uh, today we're going to be talking more about your good king. So in the last episode, we did some introductions about your writing process, writing the book in general. But today we're going to talk more thematic about the, um, the kings in general. So first, your book covers five kings. We have Khufu, Samadhi III, Akhenaten, uh, Ramses II, and Taharqa. Yeah. Why'd you choose these five? <laughs> Besides the fact that they kind of span, you know, they're a nice span of Egyptian history. Yeah. So you start, I mean, I was going to start with First Dynasty mm-hmm. and go with King Den. Mm-hmm. I picked, I picked like the best known king of the Each. best known dynasties, right? Okay. Yeah. So like, if you're going to name someone, if you go up to somebody in the public, name an Egyptian king. I kind of wanted Randy, to pull those. Yeah. yeah. The one who doesn't, or the two that don't quite fit. Would Samosra III and and Taharka. You know, exactly, exactly. So the ones that the public can't quite place are important for a number of reasons, but I wanted to hit the public with what they know and then um, hit them at the knees with Mm -hmm. what they don't know. Well, because for me, at least, like, those were, the Taharka chapter was, like, the most, because I know so much about Ramses and Akhenaten and stuff, yeah. even as, you know, a graduate student. So yeah. and even the Taharka chapter was just, you know, bringing up some ideas and notions that I hadn't thought about. We don't really get to him a lot when no, we're doing like no. art or history courses. Yeah. So we're going to have our late period seminar yes, this coming I'm happy fall. About that, yeah. It's, it's going like to be interesting. Getting to stuff. You always start at the beginning. So you always get to Khufu. You always yeah. get to Sinwazirat. Yeah. You always get to the new kingdom. So it's like nice to have Taharka. But have, I have a place. I didn't plan it this way, but I picked the most famous king of of each mm-hmm. era, if yeah. you like, not necessarily of every kingdom, though it does kind of work out that it way. Does. If you have sort of, kingdom, except new middle, kingdom, there's, there's but always you have more. Like, I think, you know, 18th versus Ramazid yeah. is a nice, you know. Yeah. And then you add your late period example in, mm-hmm. in addition, how if you determine the 25th dynasty to be late period, which is its own discussion, is it third intermediate period or is it late period? But it, I, what I didn't expect and what we were talking about last time yep. is that by hitting at the top of each era, you look forward to the fall mm-hmm. and the top is the setup and preparation for the fall. Yep. And or it's the, already, yes, the fall's already kind of happening. You yes. just don't see the effects of it yet. You're and still seeing the apex when it's actually already on the kind of. What precipice. each king does to make Egypt great again, prepares the fall, mm-hmm. paves the way. So that was, that was the most interesting thing about doing this book. Yeah. So, I mean, throughout you make, you know, the book title itself, you're making all these connections and analogies to to modern politics and modern leaders. Um, And to me, I think that's really useful to understand situations, especially for a non, you know, academic audience who's reading this book, they can, you know, make these uh, equations. Um, But I, I know, we know a lot of scholars who hate the fact that these analogies are made. Yeah. Yeah. so what is your defense then about why you think they're useful in, besides that, you know, depending on the audience? I would say this is the part of my work that makes people the most angry mm-hmm. amongst the Egyptological community, because I am not particularizing. I am not treating Egypt within a contextual bubble, but I am instead pulling Egypt into the world, ancient Egypt, yeah. into the world of everybody else. Um, and And I am thereby comparing us with our modernist exceptionalism into the ancient world. So you think part of the issue people have is it's almost like saying we're not so special and different yeah, or that the Egyptians weren't so special and different. Yeah. Yeah. I, and the, the end chapter of the whole book is that what we have been through in the last 10,000 years as human beings is the same 
if you're not in a hunter gatherer society, if you're in a herding or agricultural society, some sort of complex society, we're all in the same system, more or less. And the ancient Egyptians were in the same system as we are in now. Yes, our system is more modern and we have rocket ships and airplanes and radios and podcasts and we're more complex than they were. But the the ways that patronage works, the way that authoritarian power works, the way that masculine power works is, is very similar. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to make those comparisons rather than not. And people can get pissed off at me all they want. That's fine. Um, but I think that the comparisons deserve a need to be made. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of anything more authoritarian in its image than an Egyptian king sitting upon his throne. Mm -hmm. And to tell modern people, whether you live in Germany or China or here, that you also have a king and that you worship him and that you are one of his groupies, I think that that's a little jarring. And that was exactly what I was going for. Yeah. So I'm trying to poke everybody <laughs> and mess with them. Mm -hmm. And that is indeed the intent. Well, it's funny too, just you know, having finished up summer session A with women in power. Yeah. You know, a lot of the, the students being like, oh, I never thought of things, you know, I mean, the last week, like thinking about, you know, modern takeaways and modern comparisons. I had a couple of students in office hours comment on, you know, they never understood the origins of, you know, gender inequality and the patriarchy, yeah. but also that a lot of these things like haven't changed at all. Yeah. You know, the culture changes, the context changes, technology changes, but at the root, it's still very much the same. And the stories we tell ourselves allow an extraordinary amount of denial. Mm -hmm. And I want to mess with that denial as well, because we think that we can somehow control this earth, control this planet, control its viruses, control the animals and plants that live upon it. And we can't. That's the one thing that's always bothered can't. me about like people making humans different, or, yeah. like, separate, yeah. above everything. And yeah. it's like, no, we should all be working in like symbiotic symbiotic relationship with we're an animal you know we're not like above everything else and this is then getting us into where we are well and you know that i've been obsessed with new materialism and you were in the seminar when new materialism mm -hmm. came up so we're, we were in a social history seminar four years ago something yeah. like that is the beginning of probably yeah. your first year you and jeff maybe your second yeah, second year i think and yeah it was an awesome seminar and Danny and Nadia and Vera were like running the show, yep. right? And there was a point where we had a huge argument <laughs> about whether or not materials have agency from their own side, whether they pull people to take and them. And how they, the material affects the people. The people. And, and it was an argument offer. about gold, arguments we were about, about yeah, minerals. Value. Yeah. yeah. Materials. And I was kind of the only one on my side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you were. I was the only one, and everyone was like, no, we ascribe value to them. We, we yeah. manufacture this cultural value. These things have no value from their own side. And I'm like, absolutely not. Gold can only do certain things, yeah. copper and That's iron so can only do like, certain why do things. Like gold? It's shiny and valuable. Yeah. And... and I hadn't, and, and new materialism has been around. For a while, and this is me not knowing it because I'm in my own particular space. And and Robin Price, mm -hmm. who is finishing her PhD this coming year, said, "Well, that's new materialism." She goes, "I don't subscribe to it." Yeah. <laughs> and I went, "New materialism? What is this?" And so I started googling and bought a couple of books, started really reading, and um, I I love it. It's it's the idea that humans are embedded in their landscapes, imbe embedded in their environments, but not only that. Even just that I say humans are embedded in their environments, I mean, it makes humans separate. It yep. takes them out. It makes them something different when we are our environment and our environments are us. And it mm -hmm. is all a giant um, interwoven complex system. And humans, Egypt included, creates a narrative, an ideology in which the people are separate yep. and they have ultimate control and they're able to get everything in the, in the order that they would like and the way that they would like. And um, we do the same. And so on a very large scale, this book was a new materialist attempt of using political narrative history mm -hmm. and, and looking at it as, oh, look, it's happening again. Oh, look, the same thing is happening again. Oh, look, and then they fell and then they're rising and now it's happening again. And it's all just trying to show you that we're not that special. We're not that different. And um, we will get our just desserts. And at the, some point. the themes that I pulled, you know, these all apply still. We could talk about 
all these themes with modern contexts, yeah. and, you know, still have yeah. the ramifications of these things still yeah. going on. Um, okay, so let's get into the themes. The okay. first theme I pulled was monumentality, yeah. which I think is a great theme, yeah. right? We talked about Khufu's Pyramid. Everyone yeah. knows the Great Pyramids of Egypt, where all of Ramses II's statues, whether they were originally his or not, um, Abu Simbel, right? And unlike how maybe people initially interpret monumentality, you think, oh, he must be a great leader, has a bunch of money, like must have been a really good king to be yeah. able to make all these beautiful yeah. giant things. You interpret it a little differently in that it's a, actually a defensive maneuver. Yeah. Um, and it, vul- it shows their vulnerability. Yeah. And why do you see it in this light? So um, a lot of this is I've been formed in this opinion through other people as well and also through my own thoughts but it was uh eric wells mm-hmm. amber that's that's your it's your husband I'm familiar. <laughs> so who's that um my one of my first graduates he's my first graduate student to get his phd um uh, under my co-advisorship and who used to run which podcast what's his podcast called history of ancient, history of ancient, ancient egypt, egypt yeah. with eric yeah. wells yep. everyone wants to come back i, I know he should bring everyone it back. loves it he should bring it here back. first he should bring it back he should totally bring it back but we were in a seminar, and um, this is the beginning of my tenure at UCLA, when the grad students were not always, not Eric, but were not always super nice and mm. kind of challenged me a little bit more. And um, anyway, I just remember that feeling of the classes and the seminars. But I remember there was a period where, or a point where we're talking about all of these statues. And I'm like, why these giant statues? If we talk about Egyptian culture as not needing to to get the peasants to do anything, then why produce a massive statue yeah. at all? And and Eric's like, no, they're like, and Eric went to more of an extreme than I okay. necessarily would have. He went to um, North Korea and, mm-hmm. and um, you know, Stalinist Russia, and you need all of these statues, and it's all of this totalitarianism. And I don't think I used the word totalitarianism once in the book. However, it made me go, oh, it, it kind of shook me a little bit which is kind of ridiculous. Why would an Egyptologist not think of these things but as we being, so... we love what yeah. we study. Yep. We are apologists for these mm-hmm. people. So we, we look at it positivistically. We don't look at it critically. Like, oh, it's such a beautiful, amazing yeah. statue yeah. of granite. And We also, as Egyptologists, though we do kind of do this, we don't do it enough politically in that, why are there no giant statues of Khufu? Mm-hmm. When there are all these giant statues of Ramses, mm-hmm. and what is it about the society of Khufu that needed a yeah. giant pyramid? To, the next question. Mm, but <laughs> not. But Ramses needed a giant image of himself everywhere, everywhere, yeah. all over the place. So one needed to prove things to a larger group mm-hmm. of people, and the other one needed to prove things to a smaller or set the, of elites. He, in a way, keeping the image locked down more. Mm-hmm. It shows Yeah, he's monopolizing that know? image. Yeah. Every royal image is monopolized, but there's um, a way of disseminating that image such that you can see society through the creation of images. Mm-hmm. So, Which if, is what you talk about in the book, that he, yeah. Khufu is more like separate, more divinized, right? Yeah. If we want to do like Graeber, Salins yeah. uh, terminology that he's kept separate. And then as we go through time, the king kind of has to become more and more human right. and not a meta person anymore. Right. Um, but, the, argued. but then the other person yeah. that's super important and any Egyptologist is going to know his, his name. And I just wrote him an email the other day and he's great is John Baines, yes. who is professor emeritus at university of Oxford. And John Baines wrote, you build a pyramid because you have to build a pyramid. Mm-hmm. And I love that idea that, the kings aren't coming up with this grand master plan of what's your five-year plan as king and I'm yeah. going to do this and I'm going to do that or what's your 20-year plan or whatever. They're doing... They're not running for election. No. They just get- but they're doing things because they know they need to do them. They mm-hmm. know that it's demanded by the society in some way. And so these kings are as much cogs in a giant machine as anybody else. They don't get to run the show or decide what's going on. Mm-hmm. They have to fit the balance of power between king and elite they have to fit the environmental space that they don't they're even in. They get to be themselves. No, they, they don't. don't. Like, they don't have an identity. No, they all well, have their a... identity is king. It's not like their personal. Do you want to be king? Imagine, no, imagine. And that's why I never like people want to be politicians mm-hmm. and stuff or 
Uh, like I don't, I would not want that responsibility no. or even being a celebrity with like the paparazzi or the Olympians. The Olympics are on right now and how like the cameras yeah. are just in their face while they're like crying and, yeah. and like give them yeah. some. Yeah, it's a crazy thing. Or with, you know, Prince uh, Henry, uh, Harry, Harry and like how he's choosing to not be a part of it and everyone's, yeah. you know, up in arms about it because it's like, this is your like, this is your position that but he was born into, doesn't have choice. No. Um, and it's kind of breaking up with his family over it. Yeah. But so then the point of the Khufu chapter is looking at the pyramid as a sign of weakness mm -hmm. and weakness that might not really be apparent until three generations, four generations later or two, but it's there. And you can see like, you know, giving. Okay. So it's, you know, I think, I feel like the point is that all the evidence that could be interpreted as, Oh, Khufu's really strong. He controls everything. Like, Oh, he gives out tombs to the elites in the cemetery. They have to get buried nearby. But it could also be that, like, he has to do that to yeah. keep the elites happy. Yeah. Because he actually doesn't have full power or it's this give and take in this, this relationship. It's the same thing that I court. mentioned in my Hatshepsut books. Um, and David Warburton has mentioned the same. And I don't include Hatshepsut in this book. Um, but the idea that when you see a lot of material production by elites, you can interpret that as an empire of great strength as mm -hmm. a polity that has money to give yep. where everyone can participate in its wealth. But you can also understand it as a king that has to pay his elites to make sure that he gets their support and their loyalty. Yep. He's got to give to get. And the thing with the Khufu pyramid is that what I end up arguing is that to solidify his ultimate kingship, he has to create a structure that his father tried to create and did it three three tries trying to yep. get perfect mm -hmm. and almost got there. So Khufu is the one that's going to, to make this thing perfect. But in so doing, he has ruins to, it for he, well, he does it. He ruins it for every other king after yep. him, but he makes it awesome for the elites yep. because the elites now have, they have knowledge, training and power that they can monopolize themselves that they can hand on to their children. Yeah. He has to give them not only positions, but well-paid positions, hereditary positions, well, potentially. All the bureaucracy and organization that's needed to build the pyramid mm -hmm. itself. You have to raise all these elites to yeah. be, you know, head of, right? We have the Wadi Adar Papyrus of the yeah. guy procuring the stones. And he's, I think, like Khufu's brother, or he's involved. He's talking to Khufu's brother, who's yeah. like head of the, you know, works project in general. Like, it's all... It's not his, is it his cousin? I don't remember, but they're all family but relations. But like the Viziers yeah, are all yeah, his yeah. brothers yeah, and yeah. all this kind of, you know, they're yeah. all related or cousins. And, and okay, that's a cool point because mm -hmm. I love the idea of family. Yep. So you think of keeping that's, the money in the family. That's scene number three. Is it really? Yeah. Well, we're, I'm making her sleep around. It's horrible. <laughs> but fine. say you're keeping the money in the family. This idea of in the moment, Khufu's like, okay, I'm going to work with brother number one, brother number two, brother number three. I'm going to appoint them to, you know, to all these different things. It's going to work super well. It is going to work super well in the first generation, but two or three generations down the line, it's going to open up so a cluster F yeah. of problematic competition that is going to blow up in their faces. It's going to end a dynasty and it's going to, it's going to make people super embittered and resentful and it's going to move things onto another dynasty, fresh mm -hmm. start. Yep. So, and create lots of, you know, strong local, yeah. elites back yeah you know provincial elites which then Sinwazi the third has to deal with later yeah. on because, because when centralized patronage fails yep. what do people do the rats scurry and they go to where there's resources and the Fail. patrons in different provincial places can maintain themselves people scatter to that they become stronger the king becomes weaker and it that cycle repeats itself mm -hmm. as well throughout just wrapping up monumentality. So I noticed another kind of sub theme was the idea of, you know, quality versus quantity. So yeah. we have Ramses, who I think we all, I mean, obviously very nice statues, but definitely what's the quantity yeah. factor. Yeah. Um, and then we can think of other kings, you know, Amenhotep III, who we all agree, you know, everything. Quantity and quality. Quantity together and united. Quality. Yeah. And then we have Khufu, who has neither. Right or that we don't we don't maybe maybe yeah, there's stuff in the sand. He has monumentality, but not in, statues of himself. No, no, um, he wouldn't let people have that. I feel so. I guess how do you see this dynamic of quantity versus quality playing out? How's it useful for a king? The kings in the book. Um, you know why would one choose one over the other? 
It's and such an interesting is question. Is this more of our, you know, aesthetics? We're placing, kind of yes, kind of you know. no. I mean, you know, we work with this in seminar and class yeah. all the time. And year after next, we're going to have an art history series yeah. in which you're going to be one of the graybacks, which is going to be awesome. I know. Who's going to be we helping to lead with, this? Um, Kylie, I was yeah. testing her. Yeah. Because she's studying right now. That was her first year. She came in in the yeah, art but history she's studying seminar. For her art exam. Oh, right, right, right. And I was right. like flipping. I have all these art books yeah. in, and I was like flipping. Yeah. I was like, who is it? And yeah. she got all of them right. It's awesome. So I was like, you're going to be great. It's awesome. Yeah. She's been doing this for a while. Yeah. But but in seminars, we're always talking quantity versus quality. Yeah. And, and a, a great analogy would be Seti the first versus Ramses the second. And I love using this analogy because. You know, King's never going to leave a diary that says, today I wanted to impress the elites. And so I did. They're never going to do that. You only have what they've left behind. And what you have for Seti the First is a limited amount of production, pretty reasonable production for such a short reign, right? But yeah. like 10, 11 years, I don't remember. But yeah, short. Not, yeah. not horribly short, but not super long either. But, but, his, but his Abydos temple, which survives, that limestone temple, is effing extraordinary. Beautiful. It is just beautiful. And the tomb with the longest yeah. tunnel going to who knows where, um, deep into the depths of, of the Gorna mountain. That's mm -hmm. crazy. Right. So not a lot of tomb too. Just, yeah, he did. Yeah. He did pretty much not a lot of Second statue production, mm -hmm. but what he produced and you can say, is it our own cultural enculturation of what is quality? Yeah. But, and I, I dealt with this in my first book, the cost of death. How do you discuss quality? You discuss quality of line, precision of application, how many colors are used, um, whether it's the apprentice or the master hand, how can you tell? I mean, there's all kinds of ways to actually quantify quality. And Seti the first used high quality, high quality materials, high quality artisanship. He wanted to show what he could do the highest possible level. So who do you think he's trying to impress? Well, if we look at his origins, right? The Ramazids are a non-Theban family maybe a mercenary, mercenary family military power coming yeah. in post amarna period yeah. they have to prove prove themselves to maybe the old elites mm -hmm. from thebes mm -hmm. and to say no we're good enough to be the the kings and, yeah um i can make really beautiful amazing stuff too yeah i agree so you know? the 19th dynasty starts i mean ramses the first is a blip yeah. but seti the first is like okay the it's on one. me yeah. it's on me i have to prove that our family is not a bunch of yahoos from some provincial northeast delta, delta. <laughs> they're calling us not egyptian i'm going to show them how egyptian i am this is a very american story it's something we can truly understand mm -hmm. you know you have the catholic president who's made who creates the best white house ever mm -hmm. and has jackie O of the old money and let me show you what i can do and highest quality make it perfect yep. right yep. so i think that's what seti the first did and then he had his son <laughs> and he, he made like, <laughs> i want another oompa loompa daddy <laughs> i want an oompa loompa now and ramses the second is like fuck this shit i don't really care yeah i'm gonna go i ramses the second sees maybe because of the battle of kadesh and and the military surrounding him he sees the possibilities of populism mm -hmm. He is our Trump-like figure, yep. right? He sees the ability to take the masses of nascent middle class. Do we want to say there's a middle class in the Ramesses so, period? So you're thinking that Ramses maybe, like said he's trying to appeal to these old elites. Ramses saying, fuck we, that, I don't need you. I'm going to maybe appeal to the military or a different... Which is very Trumpian, right? Mm -hmm. Where you say, oh, we're going to drain the swamp. Drain the swamp, yes. yeah, the old. Yeah. Um, so you kind of got them in your pocket because you have the resources, you've monopolized it, so they have to come to you anyway. And now you're going to F them over. Yep. And you're going to say, I need to please my men. And your men can be in many different institutions. They can be in the institution of the army, navy, military institutions. They can be the institutions of the, the temples. Yep. And you can have other institutions potentially as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know which institutions can we add. Uh, Palace, tr trade like, and, and yeah, craft. Economic. Um, palace, but those like, are all connected, probably to a temple or a palace in most cases, right? Yeah, I mean, it's. I just wrote an article for a Feshrift that's that points out the Uba, mm. the butler, mm -hmm. becomes mentioned and very important as a king's man, a king's mm -hmm. agent during the reign of Ramses II in the Kadesh military inscriptions. Cool. And a an Uba is what 
Butler. Butler. He's like the head of the household. He's the yeah. guy, would you like your drink, sir? Your man servant. Well, I will get you yeah. this now. You know, he's like. But he's close to his person. He would taste his drink, make sure yeah. it's not poison. Make, he's close to his person, helps him dress, yep. does everything he needs to do. And Ramsey's the second institutionalizes this mm -hmm. and says, oh my God, there's some problems going down in Dear Old Medina. People are talking shit. I need you to deal with this. I'm going to send two Ubas. My right hand men. Yeah, yes. That I can trust. And okay. I'm going to have Ubas be there on the battlefield with me in Kadesh. And so there is, you can, they don't tell us, I'm going to try to please the elite. I'm going to try to be a populist. But you can see it in the material culture that one is trying to please the high elites and be like them. Yeah. And then the sun is like, screw you all. Yep. I'm draining the swamp. I don't need any of this. And I'm going for the big KFC money. And in a weird <laughs> way, almost like, you know, we see all his kids being shown. He like doubles mm -hmm. down on the like family. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, use this source, this yeah. avenue. I don't need these elites. I'm going to like promote my family, show my, all my sons and daughters. And but that brings up another interesting point yep. that, you know, I'm working on as well, which is the harem. Yep. Um, <sighs> yeah, <laughs> which is, and people don't like using the word harem. And I think we've discussed this before yeah. that it's a word that conjures up all kinds of orientalist um, issues of misogyny and female exploitation. I use the word because it conjures up misogyny and female exploitation and we should use the word. That's mm -hmm. what the females who, who were exploited in the harem deserve nothing less. So the harem produced those sons. The harem is the means of bringing in all of these young women from all of these elite families, kind of capturing them in a, not a prison, a velvet prison, what do we want to call it, but oh, nice. taking them yeah. from their families, taking their offspring mm -hmm. and then using them in different ways. You get to be overseer of this. You get mm -hmm. to be director of this. You get to be director of that. So you're bringing the elites in one step removed through the women. Yep. And it's a very clever way then of I'm thinking forward how that ends up. Oh, it destroys the, destroying two Ramsey's generations. The yeah. Ramsey's the second two generations later. It's all done. Yep. Civil war. It's all those brothers and their kids well, and their kids all and, fighting each other. Yeah. And um, yeah, of course you have, yeah. it ends with a female Pharaoh assassination of her. And that's uh, ostensibly, we don't know, but she's removed. And then 20th dynasty starts after that with another yeah. new family of mercenary type Northeastern Delta yep. guys. Yep. So yeah. But yeah. Well, speaking of which, my theme too <laughs> yeah. is loyalty and patronage. Okay. Um, right. So just kind of covering some going holistically, we have right Sinwaz with the third's crackdown mm -hmm. of elites, mm -hmm. pulling everyone back to the capital, everyone has to come to the capital. Um, taking away titles, hatias don't exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's debated. So right? debated. Ramsey's populism and right? military connections. Um, so even though these are all, you know, authoritarian regimes with one monarch, yeah, the king still needs to, obviously, as we've been talking about, you know, play to the elites. Um, and so how do you, how do we, how does he keep this balance, right? So Mazrit, I feel like most people argue with his statuary and all this stuff that he's like, there's a crackdown. Yeah. Do you see it as harsh as it's typically portrayed as working? Because then you have people like some of the people I know from that I worked with from, you know, Mayor and the old Bersha in Middle Egypt, where Mayor, M E I R. Yes, in Middle yeah. Egypt, where you have local nomarchs with the son being raised in the capital, but then he gets to come back. Yep. Um, and claims to you know have this very close relationship. And yeah. I think at the time it's Amun Memhat the third, so after yeah. Sinaz the third. Yeah. And that you have, so it seems like there is the still a give and take between Sinawazrit mm -hmm. and that. So how do you see Sinawazrit train playing out? We I think we covered Ramses and his populism a fair amount. Um, we could even talk about Pianchi mm -hmm. and Marco later on. Mm -hmm. Um, being nice right not yeah. being super because he doesn't want to kill all the people that he might end up meeting um to support well, his yeah, i mean we use the word crackdown but you know we don't have any outright evidence of heads tombs, rolling tombs you don't have anybody arrested no, nobody gets to be arrested at the four seasons yeah. <laughs> to, to use yeah. a recent analogy of a crackdown yeah. or disappears um, for a while with um mohammed bin salman um, I got that right, right? Yeah. That's the name? Okay, good. Um, but I would go with um, carrot and stick approach. Mm -hmm. um, so 
And that's why I liked the comparison for some Wasser the third with Louis XIV, Louis the 14th, the sun King yep. and the creation of a new capital and the ways that if, if a King, you know, it's authoritarian is one monarch. And we so often look at this history as the King decides the King does this or that, but it's never that no King yep. does anything on his own ever or her own. It's always with cooperation from the elites and there must be this balance. And given that there has to be that balance, Samwaster III decided that they were getting away with too much, that there was too much provincial power, too many private armies, too much control over trade and other things, yeah. trade, trade, right? So um, he locked it down. And I think, I don't know, and the Egyptians aren't going to tell us, they're never going to say, in their little diary, oh, suppress the elites today. Good <laughs> job. I'm making them all come to the capital. And it's, you're never going to see that. But what you see are things like you mentioned it, yeah. right? That all of these guys had really nice tombs in a in a succession. Father, son, yeah. grandson. There's generations of guys in one place with really nice tombs. Mm -hmm. And then whoosh, they're gone. gone. Right? Some statues are broken. Yeah. You know, yeah. And then the tombs show up at each Tawi area. Yeah, that, so then the great grandson's tomb shows up at near the king's pyramid again, right? Snuggled up into the king's necropolis at Dashur, and there it is, beautiful, maybe even more monumental than it was before. Mm -hmm. So then you have the question: It's more monumental. The guy's richer than he was before. He's not in his homeland. Is the king provide? How does it work? It? But these are the kinds of things that Egyptologists argue about, yep. right? Because the data. This, this is the data we have. You have a tomb in a provincial land. Then you have a tomb in the capital area. Mm -hmm. And the tomb in the capital is nicer, bigger, more fabulous. What does that say about elite power vis-a-vis -vis the king that they've been pulled from their provincial area and made to come to the capital and they have no more tombs out in their homeland anymore? Um, I think that as a historian, I have to look at this over the long duration of time and say that it was actually a crackdown with carrot and stick approach. Maybe there were some sticks, but we don't see any outright evidence yeah, of it. Or hide that. Um, so in the literature, seriously, mm -hmm. you know, it's very you, depressing. You better say nice things about yep. the king at all time. If you don't, you're gonna you're gonna hear about it in the but literature. Also, how the king should act too. Yeah. We'll see, actually, yeah. more. You know, so much decorum, so about much expectation. How the king is supposed to be. Yeah. Too. But there's much. Just overall, there's more morality or mores being placed on everyone. But everyone has to go up there and, and have these honorific discussions of how great the king is, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time that everyone's tombs are getting moved to the capital, you have everyone creating these loyalty, poetic loyalty expositions in which they say how awesome yeah. the king is. Yeah. And generally when that kind of thing goes down, there is an authoritarian leader who's like, bring it. I want it all. Yeah. And Someone's requesting it. Yes. You know, and it's like just, the Aeneid and Augustus. You have to kind of yeah. be, oh, we're going to have a flashback to like Augustus's, for, foretelling Augustus's reign yeah. um, within the Aeneid. Because you have, your patron, you have to be happy. Yeah. When you're, you know. But so in the same way that Louis the Fourteenth, the long duration of time is that Louis the Sixteenth gets his head cut off. <laughs> <laughs> because... If you emasculate your elites to such an extent that they cannot survive without you, and once, and it will all, there will always be a time when the king is weakened and cannot survive. So, when at the end of the 12th dynasty things get dicey in terms of succession and the elites aren't there to pick up the slack, it all kind of falls apart so, and it goes to a new dynasty. That's my question is oh, why, yeah. why don't we see, or maybe I know the answer in a, in a way, why don't we see a lot of coups or more assassinations? Or is it that we they happen, we just don't have the evidence, they cover them up, they don't want to talk about it, of course. Yeah. We only see little glimmers of things. Do you think there was more than we have evidence for? I like Walter Scheidel's work on this mm -hmm. point, who uses a different data set, um, for the most part, using Roman uh, regicide. I mean, mm -hmm. though they don't call themselves kings, it's still a regicide. But he also does comparative work looking at other regions and, and kings and talks about who would be more likely to display the regicide and claim it and who would cover it up mm -hmm. and hush it up. Oh. And the more authoritarian the regime, the more that is going to be okay. hushed up. And even coup attempts too, right? If exactly. they're not successful, why exactly. does anyone need to even know they happened? Yeah. So I think that that 
works pretty well for Egypt and we can count the number of regicides on the fingers of one hand. Yeah. It's very few, but there are time periods when dynasties end and we don't know exactly why or how. But so like now I'm thinking to like, you know, that that's little tiny piece of evidence from like the autobiography of Lenny. Yeah. Where he says there is yeah. a secret in yeah. the harem yeah. that he was privy to. Yeah. Why, why sh would he include that in his autobiography that he had access to something privy but then it's also like he's now telling everyone yeah there was this possible assassination or something was going on it's so true because if you're not allowed to talk about these bad things and then when he on the most official on inscriptional at a bido every elite goes and yeah. every elite would have seen it he's like oh yeah there was this harem conspiracy yep. Shush, and stop. i was appointed yeah. to, to be the overseer of secrets yep. right to learn about the secrets in this conspiracy and I think that that's part of the crackdown. And I also think that the more authoritarian the regime you're in, mm -hmm. the more you have to talk around something that you cannot talk about it directly. directly. Yeah, using metaphor and analogy. Everyone and... knew what he meant. Mm -hmm. And him saying that he was a part of that was part of advertising the crackdown. Mm -hmm. So I think... That and people were like, role, yes, probably prominent role. and people were like, yeah, put that, put that in there. Yeah. Put Which that down. Like we I want, we want that in there. Keeping mm -hmm. up the. And one could link that to the potential murder of Teddy, mm -hmm. though we only have that from Manetho, yep. which is a and couple thousand Chinese. years later. So good luck with that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. Yeah. So kind of on a similar note, one of the other themes, you know, looking at family, uh -huh. um, you know, we have end of old kingdom. We were just talking about all the families, you know, all the familial relations hold all the big titles. And again, going back to traditional narratives, that's linked to the fall of the old kingdom, that there's too much competition. That it's part of the reason, right? There's this squabbling yeah. perhaps yeah. going on. Yeah. Right. Elites during Samasit's reign, the children perhaps being raised in the capital, making these connections. Yeah. Um, I mean, royal women during the Amarna period, you know, particularly like Nefertiti and the role of the daughters. Mm -hmm. So we see family used at different times for different strategies yeah. to help uphold the, the regime. Um, you know, Ramses, we could talk to about naming his sons and daughters on monuments we see finally popping up. So how do you see this as useful to the king? And then when is it, you know, I feel like all these things, there's a tipping point. It's yeah. useful, but then if it's done too much or then it becomes detrimental. So it's this, you know, you're weighing the options. and Family is so interesting and there's so many things that you can say yeah. about it when one relies on it and when one doesn't. Um, to start, I will... Let's talk about Akhenaten, I think, royal women. Yeah. So, and why he elevates yeah. Nefertiti to such a... And how different role. that is from the Ramesids after. So different. Yeah. yeah. So and the daughters and... The more you... It seems on the surface, the more you rely on your family, the more you're circling the wagons, the more defensive you're being. Mm -hmm. But then Ramses II would seem to be super defensive, and that's not the case. So the, the main issue is that whether or not, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is how inbred... And that was my next question. Yeah, it's incest. How, how and maybe we should use the word like how um I mean you could use the word incestuous as an adjective, yeah. but yeah. how closed the society is versus how open yeah. it might be in another context. Not so actually incestuous, even though that was also a thing. It was actually yeah. a thing, yeah. So twelfth dynasty, super closed, um, mm -hmm. also super incestuous. 18th dynasty, old super kingdom, closed, right? super too, incestuous, say, super closed. I, you know, my or old kingdom knowledge of family at the end of, I just, all, I just at the end all of the, the six are all like the brother. Well, then, then the women come kind of to play. at the end of the six. It's, um, it's kind of extraordinary. Yeah. The, there's an attempt to crack down against on a crackdown against the women. Mm -hmm. And then there's a counter crack. Then the women just take control again. So it but seems that elites getting like Pepe more. the first, all of his sisters have all of this control. So mm -hmm. Pepe the second is like, screw this. I'm going to take all of these outside women. But those women end up getting all this control again mm -hmm. because the, of the way the system works that so they're trying to, to push power away from the elites and keep it in the family. So women get control when women get a lot of control in Egypt, whether it's the sixth dynasty or the 18th dynasty, and not in the 19th. There's not a lot of female control in the 19th. 
when women got a lot of control, it's a very closed insular society in which they're not allowing a broad distribution of power. So then for Akhenaten, do you think it shows vulnerability in him that he has to then kind of, not kind of, he, he Nefertiti becomes co-king with him. Yeah. Um, it's the only example of that. Mm -hmm. There's no other female that becomes co-king alongside Sweden. a living king. Not Tawasret. Um, Cleopatra, arguably, right, alongside her but, father yeah. and co-brother kings, thing. but it's a different deal. Yeah. But um, so, yeah, the you know we're 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 doing a long duration of time, and the book does do yeah. that. And so, I guess I would say that where, where family is concerned, it can be used in all kinds of different ways. Mm -hmm. And your family can be, I only trust the women, and so I'm just going to work with that. Or it can be like with Khufu, I only trust my brothers. And the women are played down a little bit more and they don't seem to have a political role. Yeah, more mothers, I mm -hmm. feel like it's kind of... 18th Dynasty, Akhenaten, where, you know, his wife and sis sisters, we have no evidence of sisters, his wife and daughters are everything. Yep. So much so that he elevates one to co-king. And the the daughters may have born, in my opinion, Tutankhamun mm -hmm. after the fact. Um, or during his reign and then who became king after the fact. So, and then the way the Ramesids use their, their daughters and their women is a, is a completely different thing. So that's most fascinating. It's like, oh, were they scared by the Amarna? It depends on or the society. Like just a totally different so in this, delta? all that you're asking about family in the same way that you're asking about monumentality, mm -hmm. I would treat the women in the same way, which it sounds horrible, but in a patriarchal society, women are treated as very much as objects sure. or assets to be used and owned. And I would say that the way I look at monumentality, whether it's quantity or quality, or they show their person or they only show an abstract thing, it's the same with family. Do they rely on brothers? Do they rely on sisters? Do they rely on daughters? Mm -hmm. um, do they not rely on them at all? And those are just harem women. And we're all about the cousins of the, you know, of the massive family, like in the Ramesid um, system. It's interesting that there's not more like adoption too, but I guess they don't have to, like in a more no. Roman context, right? You just adopt the person you want to be your heir. and. They, but that could happen. That's what Tutmos the first is. Oh. Um, when a family becomes too insular and too incestuous and it fails, mm -hmm. then you end up having to adopt and name someone. That's what Amenhotep the first has to do. He has no offspring. So he has to name Tutmos the first and make it, Make the dynasty continue. Or Just make his it happen. Husband, right? Like potentially, but we don't. Ha yeah, pot maybe. but or he marries her. Yeah, and that's how the 18th Solidified. dynasty continues. But to use an examination and analysis of family is, um, I would use it in the same way that I use monumentality, that I use monuments of the elites, anything to try to figure out what this authoritarian regime is not going to tell us easily. And to try to build a holistic um, and reasoned, circumstantial argument mm -hmm. for how society works mm -hmm. at a given time. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, my final theme, I think, touched upon it a little bit, but just looking at, you know, image and the relationship to ideology. Mm -hmm. And, right, we talked about Khufu not having a lot of images. Mm -hmm. Sinuazu the third. we have the typical interpretation of yeah. his statues yeah. where he looked, you know, super, uh, you know, old and like beaten down with yeah. big ears yeah. and right. But then we also have, you know, you look at Akhenaten and people have written so many books about Akhenaten's image mm -hmm. and why he looks the way he does. Does he have some, is he an alien? Does he have some genetic disorder or right? These are more readable, I guess you could say in a way they're, they're not trying to look realistic. They're, saying something else um ramsey's face everywhere we're carving yeah other old statues and then we have tarka archaizing um and yet keeping much of his kushite identity mm -hmm. and his cap in the the necklace that he wears um his musculature it's it's still there but yeah go so ahead would you say that image is either the you know the advertisement of it or the the withholding of it, like Kuku does, or archaizing. To me, it's like the image is maybe one of the most important or yeah powerful strategies a king has to yeah. to do something in his reign to solidify his reign to 
um, create a legacy for himself. Well, you know how the and maybe Egyptian... It's, maybe it's just what's left over to us. So that's what we see. We, we see the statues and... But it's all that the Egyptians, I mean, we don't have everything preserved that the mm -hmm. Egyptians would have seen, but we have an idea of who had more statues for people to see and who had less, who allowed their portraiture to be maybe a little more, this is a hard word to use, but a little more realistic, realistic versus, versus idealistic versus, yeah, or dour versus perfected, um, happy versus sad, uh, but... Or like what they were trying to say with it. Right. The so... You know what? What do the the they say is the? How do they refer to the Egyptian king in a text? Oh, it's Lord. Lord um, or the main word? It's like an ex, it's an exam. Just what <laughs> king? King. But when you say his whatever, Majesty. Did it, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. And so, <laughs> I was like, wait, what? What word? So it's Hem F. Yeah. Sorry, Hem F. Yes. And his it's Majesty. His and it's a mace, abstract, right? Yeah. Or like a club yeah. or something mm -hmm. like that. And Hem Sanya. And if you're, when you're learning Egyptian and say you use a grammar by James Ho, he's going to say your majesty. Yeah. Use a grammar by Jim Allen. What's he going to say? His right? body, his incarnation, yeah, his, incarnation his person. Yeah, his personhood. Uh, yeah. His person. So there, and we do this when we take one person and we set that person aside and we say, this person is different. Mm -hmm. This person is sacralized or divinized to go to your um, Solins and Graber on King's book. So if we're, if we're saying that they're different, we are fetishizing the body of that man. And you can't say, hey, you, come over here. You have to say, would your person accompany us? Like third person. <laughs> and you have these weird ways of speaking about the person. You have weird ways of working with the person. Do you, when you have a working relationship with a fetishized body, you can't look them in the eye in the same way. You can't address them in the mm -hmm. same way. Your working relationship might be through another intermediary. It might be through an intermediary of a third person way of talking. Mm -hmm. um, that person is dressed differently. They differentiate themselves in a different way. Yep. And so, but all we have as the archaeologists and Egyptologists thousands of years after the fact, since we don't true. have our time machines, is the texts that talk about these things yeah. that give us an idea of what the, the setting and context were like. Yep. And we have the statuary. When the king decides, I'm going to show myself, I'm going to not show myself. How and in what setting? And, and so you have Khufu mm -hmm. who decides, I'm not going to show myself. I'm going to have some reliefs in a temple context where my elites get to go. Mm -hmm. And I'll show myself my person in two dimensions in those reliefs. And my statuary, I'm not interested in statues. And my person is in the goddamn pyramid. And that is me. I'm the pyramid. And I am divine, and that is my body, and no one else gets to see it. Yep. And and that. And then we have well, Sinaras III, who's like all seeing, always present. And his images and his everywhere. scare the shit out of uh, you when you see them. There are these. Put one in the show notes because it's. Yes. I mean, what, what do you feel when eerie. you see them? How, how does it make you feel? He's very like creepy and watchful. He looks like he's like penetrating the gaze into you. Like he can read your mind. Yeah. He can read your he's soul. He's hearing everything. He's tired. He's he tired, looks... happy, sad, mean, all at the yeah. same time. As, and I say in the book something like he's like the cipher of a disappointed parent. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, he looks like a disappointed parent. <laughs> Who knows everything? Like you just got a C on your you report anyway. card. Yeah. Like, oh. It's like you really have to, I love you. Will you do that again? I will hear it with my ginormous ears yeah. and I see everything. Look how tired I am because I'm working so hard for you. But then and and he's got this, this sad, careworn face because of you. It's like a giant guilt trip. Yes. But his yes. body is cut and he's uh -huh. like all worked out and young and sprightly and yeah. can do anything he needs to do. So, and he has a ton of images. He's the one in our story that multiplies his images so that it's not just elites who can see, but Everywhere. people all over the place. Yeah. yeah. And there's dozens of him and he is made manifold. He is everywhere. Yeah. But it, it's like comparing then him to Ramses. Yeah. Where his image is everywhere. But I feel like his image is less like. But Ramses goes big. Big. Samwasrit the third, one could argue, sure, there specific. are colossals. There are colossals that could have been him. Yeah. 
that might have been retaken. Ramses II probably retook, recarved some of them. That's fine. But he didn't have the number of colossal statues that Ramses II did. Ramses II was like, not only am I going to have all this stuff that Samwatsu III did, I'm going to have all these statues and I'm going to be manifold. And I'm going to be in front of every temple and you're going to see me too. But I'm going to put two ginormous sentinel statues in front of this temple that will be me. I'm going to do it every temple, everywhere, all the time. And so he made himself everywhere and ginormous. And his face, well, what do you think of Ramses II's face? Land. Bland, super kind of smiley, drilled lips, kind of smiley, block like blockish. But I think it's because they're usually colossal statues. So yeah, it's much more like that is you can't square get as fine, face. like details. Like yeah, this one was just a monster stuff. But it's a super bland, idealized face. Like you bring to it what you want. Yeah, right. It just you look at it, you know it's Ramses, but it doesn't look like a. You wouldn't say, oh, that looks like a person. But would you agree that some Wastra the Third's images are about a crackdown trying to? get a certain reality whereas ramses the second is an advertisement trying to bring like you in peaceful idyllic. come to me yeah. i'm your dad i'm your father mm -hmm. i'm gonna make it all right so monster the third is like i'm your dad and i'm pissed and you better do what i say and most of his stuff only elites would have seen in a limited context that he's Temple, not advertising yeah. he's not making his kingship there for everybody to see and Ramses the second is. is. It's so monumental. Yeah. You don't have to be in the temple. You can see it from across the river or yeah. on a boat in the harbor. And I would say that Taharka is. Yeah. So archaism. Yeah. He's, he's kind of like a Seti the first sort of mm -hmm. guy. He he's, has to sell himself. He's trying to, to sell elites. himself to those Egyptian families and trying to be the the guy who's pious, the guy who does everything right, the guy who knows the Egyptian mm -hmm. system. And what he builds, he builds in a pious temple context. And, and that he knows almost stays. Egypt better than Egypt does at this point. Well, Egypt is overrun by immigrants and people from all over the place. The, like the original old yeah. kingdom. But he's coming in at a time where people can see that the Egypt that was is gone. Yep. Yeah. The Egypt of the old families has been overrun by the Levantine immigrants, the Libyan immigrants. Mm -hmm. Are they the same as the Sea People's immigrants? Yeah. It's arguable and debatable. But Egypt has morphed into something different. And it's very useful then in his Making Egypt Great Again bid to Harkas to say that I'm the only one that understands what Egypt used to be because I lived it. This yeah. is what I was brought up in. So much more conservative than what you guys know. Yeah. I'm going to come and and do it right. And, yeah, show you how it should be. Yeah, and his images, as you say, are very archaizing, old kingdom, mm -hmm. and um, conservative, super conservative, which then, of course, brings up Akhenaten, yeah. who's the opposite of the opposite conservative. Everyone gets their panties in a twist. Yeah, they really do get their panties in a bunch. Because the king's fetishized image is his main weapon, yeah, in a so way. I, I see it like as the main are most important right it's they don't have photography so these visual markers yeah if it's you know 2d or 3d is what they have to work with so it's like why they're choosing like why choose to show yourself in this way obviously we know there's many 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 interpretations of him so for those that don't know akhenaten's body is morphed into this strangely especially in two dimensions but in three dimensions as well mm -hmm. into this strangely elongated and pulled shape and his face is this long thing with these eyes that are just slit like and a, an oblique angle pulled face with a long nose long chin that um, reminds me do you remember those books from like the early 90s like the animorphs no because i'm you, so much would, younger than you but you, thank like, you the human like transitioning <laughs> into the animal and like the yeah. middle stage yeah. is like Akhenaten. Yeah, <laughs> because like half human, half animal, half woman, half god. Yes. Half, like he's he's morphing. You're seeing the morph. And you look at him from the side and he's got this prognathic yeah. lower like face kind of that's a snout-like yeah. thing, like a lion, like a cat, like a horse in a weird way. Nefertiti looks hips. the same. Yeah, he's got hips. He's got breasts. He's got a skinny waist. His or his wrists naked, and ankles are like tiny. No genitalia. In that one image that one. of the the colossal mm -hmm. three dimensional statue, semi colossal. What like do we want to say? Super lanky. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then, what do, what does one say about that imagery and what one is trying to communicate? We, know we have the image. We have images of him pre this 
change. Yeah. Or he looks normal. Yeah, quote unquote. And so there was a there was a conscious decision at some point. Yeah. To, I need to be represented in this other way. So if the pyramid was built because Khufu needed to prove his fetishized divine person mm -hmm. through that structure, prove it physically, manifest it, then I would say that Akhenaten was using his own body and the depictions of his own body to prove the existence of this divinity and the, uh, his connection to this divinity, I'm that just, he was a being of light. Because I'm thinking like when people would have seen him, they would have said, oh, you don't actually look like, yeah. you know, how you look at the temple or, or, you know. No, no, but he, that is how he looks at the temple in my opinion. He changes. Well, if you're like hanging out with him at court and you're like, or he comes to the window. Of hey, says, my, your person looks yeah. very nice today or whatever you say to the fetishized body of the king when you meet him at a party. But say you hang out with him at a party over lamplight, he's going to look very different than when you see him in a ritual action mm -hmm. at a temple with his window of appearances, with the sun shining behind oh. him into your eyes. And you're like, I can't really see what is going on. And he appears before you and he puts out his body for you to see. And there's finger, there, his fingers are shooting out sunlight and his, his neck is super long because the mm -hmm. sun's all behind him. And he is what he is representing. I think in all of his statues, in all of his reliefs is his body as it is suffused with the Aten sunlight. Mm -hmm. That is what he is showing. He is showing not just his body, but his body combined with light. And it is a ritual moment. And his yeah. elites only would have known what he was showing. Yeah. So Akhenaten is also monopolizing the image, as they all do. But he's you can see the society that he's sharing it with. Mm -hmm. His elites were different elites because he did an elite replacement, and that's its own discussion. But he is only sharing that with a limited amount of people, and he's not putting it everywhere. Mm -hmm. He's putting it in his temples and his spaces, yeah, and then true. it's You'll like it. no one else gets to Unlike have Ramses, this. Yes, yes. This yeah. is like so fetishized; it's beyond fetishized, and no one else gets to mm -hmm. have it. But those elites too special. who have been invited in, mm -hmm. who have actually seen it. So one could also argue that the only people that get to see those statues and three-dimensional images of Akhenaten in that way mm -hmm. are those people that have seen his physical body in the temple mm -hmm. suffused by light in that way. Yeah. You could almost make that circumstantial argument. Sure. Um, where else does he show his person at the boundary stila? In a large way. There, but then otherwise, it's always in a temple space. It's always in a circumscribed, protected yeah. space. Um, Ritualized. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. No Abu symbol sort of mm -hmm. image that you can see from the river as you go by. And you're like, mm -hmm. oh, there's my, oh, look, he's inviting me in. It's more hey, thanks, Ramses. Like, where it's more, yeah. <laughs> you know, kept yes. close. I agree. The image is kept more. And Khufu, like, in the way that what Khufu built by having to build that pyramid, mm -hmm. the machine that he created overpowered the kingship itself. And for Akhenaten, to divinize himself to that degree, the religious genie he let out of the bottle mm -hmm. overpowered his kingship yep. completely. And then the fall. Yeah. Yep. And then the fall. Cool. It's always a fall. So hopefully, as, as we talked about a bunch of these, you know, little sneak peeks to the book, hopefully it, uh, you know, whetted your appetite and you want to read more. Um, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back and talk about your conclusion um, because I love the epilogue and I think it's, I, as I told you before that I think it could stand alone by itself as a piece. Um, and it was very hopeful for the future of, you know, how things to be seen, but we'll take a quick break and then we'll come back and talk about that. Um, in a second. Welcome back. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about the epilogue now. I really love the epilogue a lot, um, but I first want to start with, you know, having done the book now, it's off to the publishers. It will be out in a couple of months. When's the exact date? November 2nd. November 2nd. But I have to read the audiobook first, and I don't know when that's happening. I think I have it. Amber, I have it blocked on the calendar. I do. <laughs> no. I don't? We talked to them about it, but we don't have a date yet. Oh, my God. Soon. Probably. I have to do that. It takes me three days. It was, a, it was a long book. Yeah. yeah. I read it over like a couple of days. So. Yeah. 
It'll take a while, yeah. but anyway. Um, you know, so first, what did you learn about writing the book in comparison to past books? Yeah. And then my major, more specific question is, you know, when you go back to teaching, we're going back in the fall, hopefully in person, um, and you're teaching the, you know, traditional undergrad M103, are you, will you gonna pull from the book and all your research you've done? Huh. You know, is it gonna change how you teach it? I, I haven't yeah. been your TA. You yeah. don't teach the typical narrative. You challenge things and you tell the students to be critical and think through I mean the evidence. Too. Yes. Um, but will this affect, you know, how you teach it all, having went through this process and looking at these famous, you know, or infamous kings of Egypt? Um, it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to use this for the 103. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's an Egyptian civilization series at UCLA. Um, it, it would be a good idea. I just don't ever have time to teach the 103 series, but yeah. maybe when I I'm not tear yeah. you, for 103A, right? My first, my, yeah, my old kingdom to, to middle kingdom. Yeah. yeah. Um, but maybe when I'm not chair, I can yeah. I can do that more. Yeah. That would be fun. Um, and it wouldn't be a bad idea to use that book to use half and half. Great. Maybe it, it would be super fun. Mm -hmm. to put them together. Um, I can't help but have my mind and my own paradigm shifted by the writing process. So I think that I do see things differently because of it, but a lot of the ideas from this book came from teaching, mm -hmm. um, from teaching art history or the Egyptian Civ history class. Course, yeah. um, and so, and you probably notice a lot of the ideas that I brought mm -hmm. up with the pyramid are there in the yeah. book, right? Well, Where, and, we, and we talk about it in seminar. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So my, my teaching and my writing are always intertwined. Yeah. These things are never going to not be intertwined. And, um, and that's okay. I that's think that's though. the way it's got to be. test out ideas. These things are all, you know, years yeah. in the making. Yeah. We've been yeah. talking about this for years and yeah. Class, so yeah, it's good to have it in stone now. Um, but as for the epilogue and yeah, what, what was your question? So, well, I was just saying, you know, specifically looking at the epilogue, you know, you end with a discussion on the patriarchy. Yeah. Um, and, the ref and the reflection of these kings on modern politics. So you bring it, you know, to contemporary topics. Yeah. And you say, quote, that the apex and centralized power usually occurs right at the moment before it all falls into a decentralized heap. Yeah. Why? Why does it, to us, especially with ancient evidence, does it look like, well, or it is the apex, mm -hmm. but why can't it? What goes sustain. up must come down. It can't be Same sustained. Same with like Roman Empire, right? The height of the Roman Empire. It but I think this is also a patriarchal question. I think that with the amount of smashing and grabbing, hoarding and amassing that the men in power do, that it can't be sustained. That it's it's always a game where the jig will be up eventually mm -hmm. when when there is enough resentment and anger and pushback or environmental challenge that it will all fall apart. So then knowing that yeah and you know so then why is you know authoritarian regimes these monarchies so seductive because they don't last they're not like long term they're very short sighted right people don't think long term people have never Selfish, thought long term i guess if that authoritarian on tv or on a dais in the ancient world hates the same people that you hate or creates a means for you to channel your energy and your anger towards a particular person that will take away from your own complicated life and it makes you feel safe and it makes you feel included. So is it fear? You will, most authoritarianism is fear-based in my opinion. It's people's fear. Yeah. Of the unknown, of change, of... Yeah, let, let me put it this way. The, the epilogue... And then how does the patriarchy fit into that? Yeah, the patriarchy fits into Same. all of it because the... Okay, let me let me put it this way. When you go home mm -hmm. to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, sorry, I was like New Jersey. That's Danny. You're Pennsylvania. Sorry. Don't when, call me from Jersey. I'm so sorry. I'm Not so sorry. From when you go home to Pennsylvania, yeah. in the on the outskirts of Philly, yes, um, you see it in a new way every time. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Because you have been away, yes. and you have gone into I, a different yeah. world, and you look back and you're like, "Holy shit! I used to so put up true. with that. Yeah. That's madness. Look what the people are doing, and look at this, and look at that." And you judge it and can see things because you have the distance. Yep. So I think that I can see my own distance in having written that epilogue. And I can see all of our increasing distance from the patriarchy as was. Because in writing this whole book, 
I'm watching everyone become woke mm -hmm. as you like, though we can talk about it dismissively. It is a real thing to suddenly look at something and go, oh my God, why do we all do that non-critically? Why do we all agree to be a part of that situation non-critically and go along with it? And I think as Egyptologists, we could say the same, oh, yeah. that we went into this positivistically, apologistically, like, all ready to celebrate yeah. <laughs> for our pharaoh and be one of the groupies, yeah. right? Now we look at it and we're like, oh my God, this is just like... Um, but it's, but it's I notice it with everything I'm doing, mm -hmm. like the Olympics. I'm like, yeah, same. Oh, I used to just like watch. The I used to watch football. I can't watch it, it anymore. Yeah, yeah. But now I'm sitting there and I'm like, yeah. All oh, these reporters are saying awful, terrible things, and yeah, why are like when they play that everyone's national anthem, like, and Ugh. now it seems nationalistic yeah. and closed and competitive, and we think of the Carrie Strug situation mm -hmm. versus the Simone Biles yeah. situation of, you know, USSR versus America and this big nationalistic struggle of one yeah. versus the other, and now we're like, no, we should all be supported, and why should you have to sacrifice your body no. for a nation, and yeah. what does that even mean? She's, and Yeah, she's not you know, she's not performing for us. She doesn't owe us anything as an American or... But the only reason I could write this book and the only reason people will be able to consume this book and the only reason I could write that epilogue is because we are day by day creating distance from the patriarchy okay. as was. So we are leaving home. Whatever that home of the last 10,000 years has been, we are leaving that home and we are- And it's uncomfy. It's <laughs> uncomfy, we, our jobs suck. We're looking at capitalism in a completely uh -huh. different way. We're talking about whether or not we should get married or not. Why do we even want kids? And what is this about? All of the things that used to be norms are now being questioned. Or expectations. Expectations yeah. of, I mean, don't get me started on image and beauty. That's still very much there. Oh, yeah. but, um, but when we come back and look at the, the, the going to Egypt for five kings, allows you in a sense to look at your own world but many steps removed thousands of years mm -hmm. removed and to look at your own world and go why would people do that why would they agree to that why would be a, they be a part of that world then look at their own world and go it's oh like, shit we do it. we're doing exactly yep. the same thing all my friends and family want the authoritarianism everyone's afraid of this or that people are agreeing to do x y and z we're all in the same thing and then to get a little bit of wokeness a little bit of distance and to be able to see that and this is where I bring my historian's lens into mm -hmm. that epilogue and say that human beings have not always lived this way. Human beings have lived within a complex patriarchal construct for 10,000 years at most, and in most parts of the world, much, much less. And where mm -hmm. we are sitting right now, um, 200 years maybe of, of some patriarchal e exploitation. Um, otherwise, this was a hunter-gatherer land where males and females had equal political power mm -hmm. in very small groups of people. Um, and a much more sustainable um, That's my next human create yes there's you know an overarching theme of unsustainability yeah and short-sightedness yeah which, rape and pillage what can i take you know, how can i get rich where is my thing yeah you know, and then i to me the answer, winning 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 yes or always ha needing to have some type of product at the end result yeah. right instead yeah. of just being like oh we're just maintaining yeah everything's fine yeah okay. um, what about the growth where's the growth, growth. you got to have growth well yeah. the planet's not growing yeah it's not getting any bigger we have so much yeah um but to me your solution is you know abolishing the patriarchy and and in a lot of cases women mm -hmm. taking in these roles with their unique experiences mm -hmm. right you do a shout outs to a couple stacy abrams mm -hmm. um maria gambuta mm -hmm. it's like all these women within varied fields who, you know, especially with Marine Gambuta's for the longest part, no one, everyone discredited her, but yeah. now she's being shown to be correct in her interpretations of things. Yeah. Um, so is that where you see, do you think women are going to save the world? No, um, because it's not a men versus women thing. Yes. And to say that women are going to save the world is to feed into the patriarchal mm -hmm. idea that it's a binary. It means that it won't be rule of the fathers anymore. Mm -hmm. It means that we won't, have our wombs controlled and monitored. No one cares who we've slept with and whether or not we're virgins. Mm -hmm. um, if we want to terminate a pregnancy, it's our body, our choice. Yep. And it's it's not about male versus female. It's about including non-binary. Yep. It's about including transgender human beings. It's about including all of the richness of biological human sexuality in a new world that is already happening on its own without with, without any systematic 
push from the top. It's happening, bubbling up from the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, that people in reaction to rampant capitalism, patriarchal wars and competitions, that people have decided to have fewer children, to not engage in the institution of marriage, to that where females are chief breadwinners, where females are out earning college degrees, mm -hmm. all of these things at the bottom are changing. I saw um, the Wharton class. It's yeah. mostly women. This, in this the upcoming. school of business, really? Yeah. Oh my First God. time ever. I mean, and then you look at the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies it's and worldwide, it's 6% female, yeah. if that. It will change. Oh no, for worldwide, it's like five, four or 5%. Five. It's yeah. bad. It's bad. But um, the point is, there's got to be a different way of living. There's got to be a more sustainable, less smash and grab, patriarchal, I'm going to go to war with you, Reporting control it. you, ah, yeah. and where women and children are the property and just, I controlled like property assets, is issue. controlled assets of people. Property is an issue. issue. Absolutely right. an issue. People owning something that someone else then can't have. And, and then what, what do I do at the end? The big thing is we need to, I think my sentence is, and I've said this in this podcast before, that we we need to remember what we've forgotten mm -hmm. and we need to forget what we think we know. Yep. And so we need to go back to a pre-complex while being complex, while maintaining our complexity. I'm not saying we get rid of technology and complexity, but we need to go, we need to learn from what we humans have been yep. as self-sustaining species embedded in our environment as nothing different from it for hundreds of thousands of years. We need to go back to that and learn from it and try to integrate it into yeah create something new doing. and then you may ask me well what will that be and i have no clue because i'm a historian not a futurist well so that's my last question right <laughs> is what do we see for the future especially of you know the united states we are flirting uh with authoritarianism i yeah, would say yeah. um, pretty clearly so as you kind of start off as you start off the book with you know being Pharaoh's groupies. And so how do we break up with the Pharaoh? Or I think in a more in a more modern sense, right? Or to put it more modernly, how do we dump the, the space billionaires? Yeah. Oh, I them? love it. How do we dump the space I billionaires? I thought of that one for a while and I was like, oh yeah, that's good. That's but really good. How do we get rid of these space billionaires? How do we move to and I guess you just kind of answered it in a way that, you know, you're an ancient story and you can't you're not foretelling the future. But if taking e ancient Egypt as a lesson well, what happens when you're married to somebody? You're not no. married, so you don't know this. But what, what happens when you're in an abusive relationship and you want to leave? What do they do? Well, most don't. You can't leave. Why? You don't have the, there's sometimes you don't have the money, you don't have somewhere to go, you don't have a support there system. There are threats, there's threats, outright there. threats, there's a threat of violence, there's a threat of exposure, there's a threat a threat children, of take you know. your children there's a threat of i'm gonna kill you i'm, I'm gonna burn the house down i'm gonna burn it down mm -hmm. and that is i think the moment that we are in so there are a number of people on the planet right now not just women my god and, and not just children yeah. but um many most of the men with whom i am associated are looking at the system around them and saying this is not the partnership that i want mm -hmm. to be in i want to break up and I don't want to be in it. And the people who have controlled us are saying, you can't break up. You can't, because I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to do this yeah. to you. I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to take this. I'm going to ruin job. that. Gonna I'm going to destroy it. And yeah, jobs killer. Da, 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 da. And we killed Applebee's. We blame everything on the millennials. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Killing mayonnaise or yeah, whatever that, or something. Um, we can make it ourselves. But yeah. who's killing mayonnaise? Apparently us. I get me. primal foods, the one, the avocado oil. It's so good. It's lovely. I like crap. Yeah. I'm an old school, like. Craft man. Really? Yeah. No, no. Try the primal <laughs> primal kitchen. That's what it's called. Um, but so if you're in, and I have been in an abusive relationship, um, not physically, but uh, emotionally and verbally. And when you want to leave, the threats are very real. And that is what I think we are all in as a human species cosmically. Mm -hmm. And the threats are, I'm going to cut down the Amazon. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to pollute this river. I'm going to build a dam. I'm going to go to war. No. And they're still there and they're bigger and more scary than they ever were before. And 
but there's another character. There's like a, an ex machina sort of mm -hmm. like thing that's going to come in and mess with everything. Yeah. And of oh, course, the clockmaker. The, it, that, that's yeah. of course Mother Earth, who has something to say <laughs> about this. Just a plague. <laughs> who sent us a plague, but a very light plague, as I very say, nice. like happy, happy plague Cheap. compared to plagues of the past, yeah. right? But the environment has something to say, and so I see it as a race towards the one patriarchal side trying to pull all of the resources and destroying as they go, and the other side saying we need sustainability, and they're racing, and. I feel that the more that's destroyed, the more this side falls back. But that means things have to get destroyed as we race. What well, I'm thinking too, because it's like when we look at Egypt, all these, you know, authoritarian regimes, and we talked about, you know, being at the apex right before the fall. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, now that we don't have solid authoritarian regimes in a lot of places, there's a check on it. So we don't get to that apex right before the fall and that there's I think there's going to be a lot of damage. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of environmental mm -hmm. and human and and natural with the insect biomass and yeah, the yeah. animal extinctions and the plant extinctions, the amount of damage that we are going to have to sustain before the human species decides on mass somehow that it needs to turn and change directions. I think it will be more than any of us can bear well and I, we were just talking earlier about you know civic duty and thinking about not just yourself but like about your community and doing things yeah. not just for and i think yeah. it's changing that mindset yeah of it's i'm not doing it for our rugged individualism as the yeah. americans love but it's that's our, poisoning us it's we need to you know it's not just about me me winning me growing me getting a bunch of money yeah how is that helping it's funny because it's not like the people on the hard right Mm -hmm. who have been controlling things and are now being seen as more hard right than they were don't know that there's an apocalypse brewing yeah everyone has i mean in los angeles you've got the zombie apocalypse of homeless people off the charts oh. you've got did you see what that they made it illegal like he, to be on the sidewalks yeah. yes but it doesn't matter unless like, you have a legal place to put these people who have no like, means are you gonna of send them a citation and good luck what are they gonna have? it's yeah. not gonna work and treating it as a zombie apocalypse is the worst most patriarchal way of going about it which is trying to shoot at things that you're not gonna you can't kill them you have to treat them as human beings and create a sustainable way out of this or it's never gonna happen or even more locally all the signs that are up about recalling um, Bonin. Um, like Bonin, yes, because the LA council member Bonin. Was the only, him and this other lady were the only two people who voted against. And he was right to vote against yeah. it. He but now right everyone's all up in arms. Recall him, get rid of him. Yeah. I want to go to the park again. But but the the hard right and the hard left, they both agree the apocalypse is coming. But where does the hard right go with their apocalypse? Well, that it's like liberalism and uh communist socialism or something but they but yeah they always go to ideology mm -hmm. so they can go to the ideology of saying you're going to make us into communist socialists stalinists and it's yeah. going to be the end of the world or they're going to take all they go stuff. biblical yeah. and say it's the end of the world <laughs> and you better embrace jesus in your heart or you're going to roast in flames it's going to be horrible those two things are generally where it goes so everyone knows the end of the world is coming but the way that people engage with that and what we have done to this planet and what patriarchy and those kings and the kings we continue to worship do to this planet, that is what we are all watching every day with our social media, on television, reading in books. And it's a race to the finish. And I, I think that. So we're still in. We're in the race. Relationship. We're we still, we have not broken up. We're trying to get out to and they don't out. want us to leave the relationship and the threats of monetary um, roasting and reputational damage. And you to walk out of relationship. I know this because I had to do it to walk out of relationship. You have to be like, say whatever you want to say. It's I am so done. Yeah. It's over. Whatever you need. What do you want? You want me to write you a check? What, what do you need? What, what can I give you to make this possible? And, and whatever you need, you need to have no Fs left to give to be able to walk away. And people are approaching that point. And the cap, ironically, and I make this point in the book, it's, it's so ironic that the very thing that drives people to the brink, that makes them want to break up with the person, is the very system itself. That the more capitalist 
it, the more unregulated capitalism we deal with, the more busy we are, the more so overworked, awful. the more, oh, there are so many jobs. Look, everyone could have two, <laughs> right? Yeah. And we all get to do two jobs and we're all like freaking out all the time. Or even the whole idea of like self-care has become so like monopolized. Yes. Like it's not even like relaxing because you're like, not. I'm doing this because I'm like so tired and yeah. uh, burnt out. And HR will tell this, you. Uh, oh, just do a face mask and yeah. it'll cure everything. Everything like, will be fine. It's, it's a self-care just, day. Just, yeah. But all of that is um, ramping up to such a level that people just, they're just like, I'm, I'm out. Yeah. I'm out. I'm not so, going to take that shitty job where you pay me $7 an hour. I'm so just in, not going to do it. In the same way that Khufu or Samwastra III mm -hmm. create the own end point a couple of generations later, our society today and the capitalism and exploitation and overwork and stress and all that we're doing and the inequality has created its own end game. And it's all, the dominoes are already falling. So I don't have to say it. No one else is. It's not. You don't need one savior to come in like in Independence Day and to say we're going to get the aliens. And it's no. this is not that. This is a whole human organism that either is going to make it through this fire and come out the other side with some system of sustainability, or it's going to burn. <laughs> and that's it. And um, it's an interesting time to be alive. So on that note. Break up with the pharaoh. <laughs> Break up with the pharaoh. Please do it. Walk away. Just walk away. So, um, where can we find your book? Hopefully, Any, now you want to read the book. You want to you want to pre order it. So, where can we find your book? Anywhere books are sold. Books are sold. And in Los Angeles, I have a sweetheart deal with Book Soup, like yep. the soup that you eat. And uh, if you order through them, I'll sign my name to your book, so you can, book you can go or there. Personalization. Mm -hmm. um, books out November second. Yep. So be on the lookout. Um, in the meantime. I think we'll be releasing some older content in our first with some new stuff. So be, uh, be on the lookout for that. Um, but thank you. This thank you. Great. Thank um, you, Jordan. This is After Lives with Kara Kumi. Thank you, guys. Thank you to our listeners for your support and for subscribing wherever you listen. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five-star review and help raise our profile and let others know about it. Send your questions related to the show and topic suggestions for future episodes to karakuni at gmail.com. You can find the video version of the show on my YouTube page and full show notes will be posted in the podcast section of my website, karakuni.squarespace.com. For that, thank you, Amber Myers-Wells. There you'll also find info on my books, upcoming lectures, and you can subscribe to my newsletter. You can find me on Facebook at Karakuni Egyptologist and on Twitter and Instagram at Karakuni. See you next time on Afterlives with Karakuni.